style gun like the AR-15. Hi, everyone. Well, welcome to the Assault Weapons Ban in the Americas webinar. Uh, before we begin, I want to advise our Spanish participants that we have two interpreters, Ruth Warner and Elena Holly Craver. Um, there is a button on the taskbar on the bottom there with a globe. You have to click that and you can choose Spanish. On behalf of the Newtown National Alliance, I would like to thank all the panelists and all the participants for joining our important conversation today. Our webinar is part of the 2020 webinar series of the newly formed Network for the Prevention of Gun Violence in the Americas. Newtown Action Alliance is a proud member of the network now. The, the next webinar in the series will be held next Tuesday. Um, the Consortium of Universities for Global Health is hosting the conversation on gun violence in the Americas, local solutions to a hemispheric challenge, and we encourage you to join. For those of you who do not know me, uh, my name is Poe Murray, and I have been leading the Newtown Action Alliance, a grassroots gun violence prevention organization that was formed by the Newtown community members. After my neighbor used an AR-15 and high capacity magazines to murder six children and educators in less than five minutes at the Sandy Hook Elementary School, we felt compelled to take action. My husband, Tom and I, um, raised our four children here in Sandy Hook. And since that tragic day, we have unapologetically fought for a ban on weapons of war and many other necessary gun control policies to reduce all forms of gun violence. I am thrilled uh, to be joined by Dr. Stephen Hargarten, Manuel Oliver, Philip Alpers, Eugenio Wigan Vargas, Dr. Kyle Ann Hunter and Eve Levinson. These amazing panelists are my heroes in our collective fight to end gun violence. Together, we will discuss the lethality of assault weapons, high capacity magazines, and its ammunition. We will shed some tears for those who have lost their loved ones due to weapons of war. We will hear the perspective from our allies in Australia and New Zealand and explore the impact of our weak gun policies um, <clears throat> that impact the country south and north of our border. We will review what actions have been taken to ban weapons of war in the US. And finally, we will conclude our webinar with action items for you to support the campaign against assault weapons. I'd like to begin by defining assault weapons and quickly reviewing the 1994 ban on and its impact and sharing some information on the campaign against assault weapons. The gun lobby and their supporters often question whether or not those of us working on the, uh, in the gun violence prevention space can define an assault weapon. I often describe it as a weapon that can kill 26 children and educators in a matter of minutes, but Senator Dianne Feinstein and Representative David Cicilline have um, defined the uh, assault weapons for us in their bill. An assault weapon is any semi-automatic rifle or handgun that accepts a detachable magazine and has at least one military feature. It's also a, um, a semi-automatic rifle or handgun with a fixed magazine that accepts more than 10 rounds and, and any semi-automatic shotgun with one of the following characteristics, detachable magazine, revolving cylinder, fixed magazine that accepts more than five rounds or at least one military feature, and any belt-fed semi-automatic firearm. President Bill Clinton signed the assault weapons ban into law on September 13, 1994, but the law expired on September 13, 2004 under President George W. Bush. 
Since the ban expired, the gun industry ramped up the marketing and sale of assault weapons. Since we do not have a federal registry on assault weapons, we don't know the exact number of assault weapons in America. However, the trace estimated that there are 15 to 20 million assault weapons in circulation using the data from the National Shooting Sports Foundation, the gun lobby group that's headquartered right here in Newtown. Compared with the 10 year period before the ban, the number of gun massacres during the ban fell by 37%, and the number of people dying from gun massacres fell by 43%. Since the ban was lifted in 2004, gun massacres involving mil military style weapons are way up. In the decade after the ban, there was a 347% increase in fatalities in gun massacres, even as overall violent crimes continued downward. Assault weapons are the weapons of choice for mass shooters. The majority of Americans are now living in fear, including our children, who are exposed to lockdown drills in their schools. According to the research done by the Violence, Violence Policy Center, one in five law enforcement officers were killed in the line of duty in 2016 and 2017. The police are arming themselves with assault weapons so that they are not outgunned. Now there is an arms race between civilians and law enforcement, which contributes to police violence. Despite the rising number of mass shootings and militarization of law enforcement, only seven states in Washington, D.C. have banned assault weapons, and only nine states and Washington, D.C. have banned high-capacity magazines. This is why a federal ban on weapons of war is absolutely necessary. When we first joined the gun violence prevention space after the Sandy Hook tragedy, we were told to back off on pushing for a federal ban on assault weapons. As newbies in the space, we embraced the low hanging fruit strategy by uniting around the Mansion Toomey bill, which was the weak and inadequate background check bill that was written by the NRA. The GVP movement believed that once the background check bill passed, we could build on that success. Regrettably, the bill did not pass and we didn't see any federal gun control bills moving forward for years. In fact, no substantive gun control bill has been passed since 1994. So we decided we needed to push the reset button and do a better job of fighting the NRA. After the Orlando shooting, we worked with Julia Wyman, the former executive director of States United to Prevent Gun Violence to establish the campaign against assault weapons. Through the years, we were able to build a broad coalition I'm sorry, we're not on the right one. Through the years, we were able to build a broad coalition of more than 290 local, state, and national gun violence prevention organizations, chapters, allies, to support the campaign. We began routinely traveling to Capitol Hill with families who are directly impacted by gun violence, like Fred Gutenberg, Sandy and Lonnie Phillips, Kristen and Mike Song, and many others to push Congress to pass the assault weapons ban legislation and many other gun control bills outlined in the Denver Accord, which is a comprehensive policy prescription to end all forms of gun violence in America, including everyday gun violence, suicides, unintentional shootings, and police violence. We worked very closely with our friends at Brady and March for Our Lives to seek additional co-sponsors for Representative David Cicilline from Rhode Island and Senator Dianne Feinstein's assault weapons ban bills. We now have 216 co-sponsors for the House bill, which is more than any other gun control bill in the House, and 34 co-sponsors for the Senate bill. The, there are reps who will not co-sponsor the bill, but they will vote for the bill. Um, we have made significant progress. The House Judiciary Committee held its first hearing on assault weapons ban last September. Now we are pushing them to mark up reps, Representative Cicilline's bill and send it over to the full House for a vote. Um, we have done a vote count and we have the votes to pass the ban right now. Um, passing it in the Senate is obviously a different story with this political makeup. After the, 1990, um, after the 1994 ban and before 2012, even Democratic politicians were running away from the assault weapons ban, but the conversation has changed significantly. Hillary Clinton went bold on her gun control platform in 2016. Now, and now in 2020, all Democratic candidates, presidential candidates supported the ban. 
It's our job to ensure that the ban is a priority for all congressional candidates. I believe that we can pass a ban. If we can keep the House, flip the Senate, and the White House, we will be able to join other nations like Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, who have banned assault weapons after their mass shooting tragedies. So it's time for US to act. And so that I wanted to set up the stage for what was happening in the United States. And next, I just wanted to um, have Dr. Harkutten explain to us what's happening to the body due to assault weapons. So I'd like to introduce our first panelist is Dr. Stephen Harkarten. He's the director at the Comprehensive Injury Center, the associate dean at the Office of Global Health, a professor of emergency medicine at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and he is a co-founder of the Network for the Prevention of Gun Violence in the Americas. As an emergency medicine expert, he has, he has firsthand knowledge of the lethality of assault weapons and its ammunition. So take it away, Dr. Hargarden. Thanks very much, Poe. Um, very much uh, um, yeah, delighted to be uh, joining this conversation and this important conversation on examining assault rifle bans in the Americas. Uh, my focus is going to be on the bullets and the rest of the panel will be discussing the guns that carry them. Uh, next slide. Um, the examination that I wish to proceed with is consistent with public health science and applying those sciences to gun violence where many, many uh, groups and organizations are examining high-risk groups, youth, women, a previous uh, panel discussed uh, the impact of uh, vulnerable populations uh, from, this, uh, from this product, the environment in which these communities are, are, are affected in the Americas, in the United States, in Mexico, Central America, and the importance of civil society leaders coming together as part of the environment. But my focus uh, in the next few minutes is gonna be talking about the bullet and its effect in the human body and the rest of the panel talking about the guns that carry these bullets. Next slide. As an emergency physician, I have seen hundreds and hundreds of patients harmed by a bullet as it enters into the body, in this case, the upper extremity, and the bullet shatters, in this case, the humerus. This individual is uh, really facing a lifelong disability uh, from this energy transfer, this transfer of mass and energy uh, from the bullet. And what I and colleagues at the Medical College of Wisconsin wanted to examine further the impact of a assault rifle uh, bullet and its impact on human tissue. Next slide. So we went to the crime lab uh, and uh, discharged the bullet through gelatin. And here's you're seeing now the impact of uh, this bullet going through gelatin. Can you hold the slide there, Tiffany? And see that the, the as a bullet has, trans, uh, has transferred through the gelatin, the extraordinary expansion of the of the uh, of the forces with the temporary and, and permanent cavity formation affecting this gelatin, which is a human uh, facsimile of tissue, a human uh, uh, tissue facsimile. It gives you an idea of how much energy is being transferred by the bullet. This is a 5.56 NATO bullet, which is a very typical bullet discharged from assault weapons, assault rifle. Next slide. So that's the full impact of this bullet going through the gelatin. And there's so much energy that went through it. Actually, it moved the gelatin uh, during, our, during the course of our experiments. Next slide. In comparison, this is a 40 caliber projectile. You know, notice as it travels through the gelatin, go ahead. The temporary and permanent cavity is markedly different than the assault uh, rifle uh, uh, bullet. and gives you an idea about the extent and nature of, of the uh, damage to human tissue uh, from these two projectiles going through tissue. Next slide. And this is a static comparison between the 40 caliber bullet and a musket ball bullet, typical of those that were discharged in the uh, uh, 1700s. And notice that there's a fairly similar quality to the temporary cavity, but the energy transfer is slightly less with the musket ball compared to a 40 caliber uh, bullet. We felt this was important for comparisons and contrasts for us to be shaping future discussions about these bullets and the guns that carry them. 
Next slide. So while this slide's a little complicated in terms of uh, information and, and numbers, if you could go to the, the far right side of that second from last column there, you can see the energy lost by bullets while passing through the gel. Notice the comparisons and contrasts. The 5.56 NATO carries over a thousand joules of energy that was transferred in the gelatin compared to the 40 caliber and the musket ball, which is markedly less than the 5.56 NATO. Hence, its ability to harm its intended victims, hence its usage in the military. Next slide. But this informs our discussion about the bullets that he carried for the Sandy Hook shooting. And Poe has mentioned 26 people died, 20 children were struck by these bullets. It was a 100% case fatality ratio. No child survived after they were struck by these bullets. 154 bullets were released in this event in less than four minutes. If you calculate the rate of bullet release, is equivalent to 19 militiamen storming Sandy Hook, assuming that a militiaman in 1780s could reload and refire two times per minute. But if you look at the rate of energy release, and we've documented this now in the table that I've just shown to you, this energy release is equivalent to 171 militiamen storming Sandy Hook. This energy uh, equation, this energy uh, comparison and contrast, I think is important as we move into a discussion about these guns and their distribution in civil society. Next slide. So in moving forward and with this panel discussion, we we'll look forward to what's needed is a focus on this rifle and the bullets they carry. We need to advance policy research and evaluation on its product's role in civil society and leadership of civil society across the Americas and what we hear from uh, Philip Balpers across the world needs to converge and align to help make our communities healthy and safe for everyone. Thank you. The next slide. This is a, uh, a stark image of the distribution of this product globally and that fact that tens of thousands of children have access to it. Final slide. So um, I leave you with that uh, at the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hargarten. Um, your bullet and energy analysis suggests that there are implications for the care of patients injured by these bullets. Can you elaborate a little bit on your findings? Well, I think as we just, uh, as I just mentioned, with the case fatality ratio of 100% uh, at Sandy Hook, Parkland was less than that because these are older uh, uh, adults, if you will, these youth, these adolescents. And so we're starting to examine how this energy exchange has adverse effects depending on age. Obviously, it has adverse effects in terms of location of where the bullet enters the body. But just from an energy uh, calculation, these uh, bullets are uh, in the younger age group, particularly children, are pretty much uniformly uh, a fatal event. Uh, you're on mute, I believe, Po. Oh. Thank you so much, Dr. Hargarten. We're going to move on to our next panelist, uh, Manuel Oliver. Um, he's my friend. Um, he's the founder of Change the Ref. He's the father of Joaquin Oliver, also known as Guac, uh, who was killed in Parkland, Florida on Valentine's Day in 2018. Um, and Manny and Guac are the most creative artists in the GVP space. And I'm so pleased to have him join our um, conversation today. Manny, you know firsthand that assault weapons and AR-15s don't belong in the hands of civilians. Could you tell us your personal story and what you know about the lethality of the AR-15. Sure. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's, it's an honor being here. Um, trying to explain what happened to me is not easy. Uh, believe it or not, two years later, a little more than two years later, I still have to have these bizarre conversations like this one. Um, I find very disturbing that we need to show how much damage 
is DOS to the victims. Like, like if we need to explain this more than the, the simple explanation that Joaquin and another 40,000 uh, victims are not here anymore. Um, the only good news here, and after listening to Dr. Stephen, is that I've, I'm always um, thinking that what happened to Joaquin was fast, right? So this, this weapon is so powerful that the only good news is that my kid didn't suffer that much. He was shot four times. And, and now let's, let's go back to what we have been doing since that happened. We have been doing what I just saw in your face. We are trying to um, be very um, direct, very um, to the point when it comes to the story itself. Um, I, as you, we know each other um, uh, pretty well, and, and you know that I'm not a, a, a person that will be, not, neither me or Patricia will go to DC to spend hours talking to politicians. I, I try to bring the message, the, the obvious message um, to the people because I really think that things are gonna change in a social way, so no one will be able to reverse them again. If I can share something on my screen that I would love to show you, that will explain kind of the techniques and strategies that we use in Change the Ref to speak to people about these issues. So. Go ahead and push the share screen button there on the bottom. Okay. You can see the screen, right? Yeah. Yes. There you go. A deadly shooting rampage. It was an AR-15, a powerful military-style gun like the AR-15. More than three million Americans own an AR-15. It just keeps being used for these massacres. Assault rifle wounds are radically different. The bullets go in and basically explode inside the body. The destruction that it, it causes is simply devastating. I was a treating physician on the day of the St. Hood tragedy. They were so horribly injured from assault weapon gunshots, they were essentially dead at the scene. My name is Manuel Oliver. I am Joaquin Oliver's dad. I lost my son in the Portland shooting. He was shot down with an AR-15. The system continues to ignore the assault rifle problem. That's why we're coming together as clinicians and family members in order to unite as one strong voice. It's called impossible operation because when the destruction of tissue is so severe, despite how good we are, there's sometimes nothing that we can do. I know this game is ridiculous. You know what else is ridiculous? That millions of Americans are actually owning a gun that should be owned by the army. We members of the medical profession are teaming up with parents to send a message. We're sending this game to the press. We are sending this game to Congress. Congress is in session right now. And we're going to make sure they hear our message. Bring S-66 to a vote. Stop the unregulated sales of assault rifles. Go to impossibleoperation.com. Okay, so, so now you know um, what we I think you accidentally muted yourself, Manny. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, cool, perfect. So that goes back to what I was trying to, to say at the beginning. Um, 
I, I, I find very um, disturbing the fact that we need to explain this over and over. Um, I don't think that anyone is, is winning with having these weapons out, out there in, in, in hands of civilians. And we have done very little since Joaquin was shut down. And that, that's kind of frustrating for me. Um, if you go to Parkland um, and, or, or any community that has gone through, through a situation like the one that we went through, they just try to uh, forget about what happened and move on and pretend that, that it already happened in Parkland, it's not gonna happen again. And, and I'm pretty sure that it could happen again. There is no reason why it wouldn't happen again. We haven't done enough. Um, so I, I have uh, all my faith and hope uh, on March for Lives, on the youth of this country, because I know that um, they are fighting for something that they will be taken care of. They're fighting, fighting for their own future. I think that our generation failed, and, and now uh, some of us are paying a big price for that, which is losing our loved ones. And some others are just being in the middle of what it should happen, like disturbing the, the, the path that the youth in America are trying to find and reach, and they will. So um, it's late for me to protect Joaquin, but it's not late for us to protect all the rest of the kids out there. Um, our voice is gonna be loud and clear, and we're gonna keep on doing campaigns to make people feel uncomfortable and, 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 and somehow uh, find that um, social, getting along each other. Like, I'm, and we're not trying to compare ourselves with, with uh, third world countries. We're talking about New Zealand, Canada, and Great Britain, and Australia. Why, why is it wrong to learn from them things that are already working? Are, are we that arrogant in here in, in America? Is that, is that gun culture, mainly power gun culture, so addictive that we cannot get rid of it? So those are the things that we need to question ourselves. And, and I'll be doing this till my last day here. So I can promise you that we're not gonna stop fighting until we find the results. Well, thank you, Manny. You've been um, just amazing activists, you know, being so creative in your efforts. Um, I know that you won't go to DC with me and lobby Congress. I know that, but you're- I'll be outside. <laughs> but you're doing it in many other ways, you know, to create that cultural shift that we need. Um, but I wanted to um, have you share some, um, some thoughts on this. Um, about 18 years ago, you and your wife, Patricia, emigrated, to, uh, emigrated from Venezuela to the U.S. Um, with your daughter and Joaquin. Um, what were the factors that influenced you, your decision to move to Parkland, Florida? And did you witness gun violence in Venezuela? And were you shocked that assault weapons were so readily available here in the United States? Um, yeah, uh, there's no way to ignore gun violence in Venezuela, number one, okay? Um, it's everywhere. It's a different kind of gun violence. Um, it's uh, usually handled by criminals. Uh, it's pretty hard to find that your neighbor decides to get into a school and start shooting kids randomly, or go to a nightclub, or go to a yoga salon. You don't, you don't find those situations happening in Venezuela. Uh, so. Let's say that it, it, in, in a way, you can, you can go through the tragedy and somehow elaborate the reason why that tragedy happened, okay? It's a third world country. There's a lot of um, um, social not balanced situation, a lot of people needing things, and there are guns out there in the black market. So, so yes, those are the, the reasons. Or, or put it this way, that is the main reason why people like me moved to this country or other countries. We had the opportunity to move to Spain too. We were debating about going to Spain because I'm an European citizen or coming to Florida. We decided to come to Florida because it was closest to Venezuela and the kids will have a great education. So um, I don't regret that decision. Joaquin loved this place. I think he was made to live in America. He loves, he loves the whole culture behind this. Um, and he also started um, as an activist, and I, and I was able to witness this, and this is probably the most shocking thing here. Um, and more than once, he opened a debate or a conversation about gun violence. I remember how he felt after the Pulse nightclub situation. 
and we, we, we had that discussion at home. And then he tweeted a couple of things. And, and then I remember how he felt about the Vegas shooting because his mother, Patricia, was there a week before. So as much as I don't regret that, um, I think that things would have worked different if I would have moved here because we subestimate the, the, the messy situation behind the gun industry in America. Nobody, nobody's telling us that this is happening. So and that brings more reasons for me to be here. Because now, when people listen to me, they don't have an excuse. I mean, I was not able to be on a panel like this one before two years ago. And they will tell me, hey, listen, this could happen to your kid because this, 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 and that. And in country to the other, well, these are the risks that you're going to take. And we are very good on that in the United States. Warning people about flying to other destinations. Don't fly to Mexico because it's dangerous. Don't fly to China. Don't fly to Europe because you can get the COVID-19. Well, guess what? We have a lot of pandemics going on in this country. But again, we are arrogant. And our actual leaders are more arrogant than all the leaders before together. So as much as I'm not into politics, I'm pretty sure that I'm not understanding what's going on right now. And I have the right to vote, which is another benefit of moving here. So I'm not only words and drawings and murals and campaigns, I'm also gonna get out there on November 3rd and, and, and doing the right thing. And, and again, there's a lot of us. And that's what we need to do now. And that's what the whole thing about the events that we plan, it's, it's, we, we need to start showing them how many we are. We're a lot, because that's what they've been doing for the last decades. But they're not that many. We are a lot. So yes, I decided to move from Venezuela to the United States. And guess what? Now I'm an American citizen. And now I have issues in this country. And my role is to solve the issues in the country that I live in, in the same country where my son lost his life. Actually, on February 14th, when Joaquin was shut down, I decided to start living Joaquin's life. So I was 50 years old by then. That's enough. 50 years is a lot. I had fun. Now it's time to start living what Joaquin won't be able to live. And that's why you see me reacting like this, like a 17 year old. And I love it. And it connects with the youth. So be ready for my next 50 years. Because we're going to make a lot of noise in here. And you know what? Fred said that you are really cool. And you are. You're one of the coolest people I know. And I know that Bob is so proud of you. Because we are too. And we know that you will see change. You know, because of your efforts. So thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, the next panelist um, is Philip Alpers. Um, he was not able to join us uh, to, in person because it's about 3.30 a.m. in uh, Australia. Um, but he is the director of gunpolicy.org and an adjunct professor, associate professor at Sydney School of Public Health and he is a faculty member of medicine and health at the University of Sydney. And we have a pre-recorded video presentation of a perspective from Australia and New Zealand. All right, Poe, just one moment while I go grab it again, please. Okay, no problem, Tiffany, thank you. So for our audience today, um, if you have any questions for the panelists um, at the end of the program, please feel free to jot it down in the chat box and we'll try to answer those questions for you. I'm going to have to re-download it again. So if there was a question before, if you could take it now. Okay, great. Let's see. Here 
there's not a question, but you know what we can do is we can move forward. Uh, we can move um, onto our next panelist and then we'll go back to Philip's presentation. Um, let's see. So the next panelist is Eugenio uh, Wygen Vargas. He has two last names. He is an associate director for gun violence prevention at the Center for American Progress. He has performed extensive research focused on preventing arms trafficking and gun violence in the US and Mexico. He has published numerous reports, fact sheets, and issued briefs advocating for measures that strengthen gun laws in the US um, at the state and federal levels. Um, thank you for being here with us today. Um, Eugenio, you've done extensive research um, on the impact of US guns in Mexico due to our weak gun laws. Um, and I just wanted you to share um, your um, experience and research on the international impact of the assault weapons ban in, um, and the, the ban expiring in 2004. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can you see my screen? No, not yet. No? Okay, hold on. Maybe I need to share. Yep, push share. Okay. Um, maybe, maybe I need access. Okay. Hold on. Sure. Yeah. Maybe. There we go. There you go. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much, Poe. Uh, yeah. So, uh, in addition to the numerous challenges and problems that arise with assault weapons within the country in the United States, there's also the issue of U.S. guns flowing, uh, to other countries, particularly to Latin America. Uh, and specifically, I'm going to focus more on, on Mexico today. Uh, so I would start by, by saying that when you address gun trafficking, like, like addressing other forms of trafficking, the challenge is the data, uh, getting access to data. Uh, but despite that challenge, there's enough information to tell us that uh, U.S. guns flow to other countries, that this has a devastated effect within these countries, and that there are policy solutions within the United States that can be implemented to reduce this type of problems. Uh, this first graph here is very interesting to me because it shows that the production of guns in the United States was somehow uh, following a similar trend as household uh, gun ownership in this country. And then all of a sudden, during the mid 2000s, uh, particularly to the point where the assault weapons ban was removed, but also around the time where the TR amendment was, uh, was passed and around the time of PLACA as well. Uh, all these three combined uh, had an effect, negative effect on efforts to mitigate uh, gun trafficking. Uh, so it's around this point where the production of guns in the United States and trends of gun ownership short, sort of shift uh, in, different, uh, in different directions. Um, and, and, and in this sense, there are potential explanations for this. One of them, it, and we have to recognize, is the fact that gun owners in the United States are now owning more guns. So the gun ownership is more concentrated within this country. However, even if we, if, if we consider that um, analysis from, from academics from Harvard University have found that the growth of U.S. gun ownership from 1994 to 2015 was about 70 million uh, guns. The difference was of about 70 million guns. In 1994, uh, a survey estimated around 194 million guns. And in 2015, it was estimated to be around 265 million. So there's a difference about 7 million guns there. However, during the same time, the production of guns increased 166 million guns. So, there is some differences there that we need to consider. So it is true that gun owners now own more guns, but there has to be another explanation for why this discrepancy. Um, uh, in addition to considering the fact that many guns stop working uh, and also the fact that, uh, that in the surveys, many people will not tell the truth about the number of guns that, that they own. But despite these this facts, this number to me is very staggering. This discrepancy is very staggering. So the other hypothesis becomes, well, many of these guns are moving to international markets. Um, and I'm going to focus here on the, on the specific case of Mexico. 
Uh, so you see here on, 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 the, on the graph in the top is the production of uh, U.S. guns, like I mentioned. Uh, and on the bottom is, is the level of homicide uh, in, in Mexico, the number of homicides uh, in, in Mexico. Um, however, th there is evidence that this is more than a statistical coincidence. As you mentioned, Poe, I, I believe you, you have this same graph as I, I do right here. It's gone, particularly after the mid 2000s, was driven by pistols and rifles. Uh, like we would see later on, these are the main weapons of choice by criminal groups in Mexico. In fact, I have a, 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 a stat right here. There's a newly released report from the Ministry of Mexico that reveals that seven out of the 10 firearms that are confiscated in Mexico were either pistols or rifles. Although 13% of those guns that were recovered were not able to be identified, which means that they could also be pistols and rifles. But at the very least, seven out of 10 of, the crime, of, of guns recovered in Mexico are either pistols or rifles. Again, this shows that this is more than a statistical coincidence. Um, another important point is the fact that gun violence in Mexico also rose dramatically. Uh, so for example, in 2004, uh, only 25% of homicides were perpetrated with a gun in Mexico. By 2017, this was closer to 66%. And in fact, uh, as I was checking on some figures, in 2019, that figure became 69%. So homicides have played a major role uh, in fueling and increasing homicides in, in Mexico. <clears throat> Also, there's, a, there's a, the known fact, and this is from ATF reports, that crime guns recovered in Mexico and sent for tracing to the ATF show that around 70% of guns recovered in crimes in Mexico originate in the United States. This 70% figure has been very consistent uh, across the years. Having said that, uh, the remaining 30% Sometimes the origin is not well established or, or known, uh, which, means that, which means that potentially they could also be originated in the United States. But at the very least, 70% of, of crime guns recovered in Mexico uh, originate in the United States. <clears throat> now, there's also, this is very interesting because there's even academic research that shows that this is a huge problem. Uh, in 2014, an article called The Way of the Gun, they estimated that around 213,000 firearms were purchased annually in, in the United States between 2010 and 2012 to be trafficked to Mexico. Uh, another important research which hits specifically on the assault weapons ban was conducted by uh, Garcia Ponce and another two researchers. Uh, it's called Cross-Border sp Spillover. Uh, they found that the removal of the assault weapons ban in the United States during 2004 had, a, had an effect on the rise of gun homicides in Mexican municipalities that border uh, Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. It was not the case for those municipalities bordering California, and the reason that the authors mentioned is that California maintained its own state-level uh, assault weapons ban. So it's pretty two, uh, two pretty interesting academic uh, articles that show that this is an important problem. Um, and this is how confiscation looks like on the U.S. side of guns going to Mexico and then on the north side, U.S. guns that have already reached Mexico. And as you can see from the pictures, these are, these are guns that are AR-15s. Uh, this would fall under the definition of assault weapons. Again, these are the weapons of choice for criminal groups uh, in, in Mexico. Um, just want to highlight a couple of statistics here. Data from Mexico's foreign minister indicate that the confiscation of assault weapons grew 122% in 2019. The organization uh, Stop U.S. Arms to Mexico, uh, which is run by John Lindsay Poland, who we all of us know, uh, has compiled data on firearms recovered in crime scenes in Mexico. I invite all of you to visit their website because they have a very interesting map on this firearm guns that have been confiscated in Mexico from 2010 to 2018. They indicate that of the 65,000 recovered weapons with an, an identified make and caliber, 18% were identified as assault weapons. 
However, they do recognize that some of the other confiscated weapons could also fall uh, under the, uh, the definition of assault weapons, but they were not able to identify because he were the maker was not well understood or the caliber uh, was not known. But this, this goes to show that, that the, 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 the assault weapons are flowing into this country in great numbers. Also, uh, the same uh, organization, U.S. Stop Arms to Mexico, indicates that since 2010, 650 caliber rifles, mostly Barrett rifles, were recovered in Mexico. This is not a minor thing. Uh, this, this type of rifles have been, can and have uh, taken down military helicopters in, in Mexico. Their power is tremendous. Um, and again, findings from the, from the organization Stop U.S. Arms to Mexico also coincide, excuse me, also coincide with recent reports from, the, from Mexico's foreign minister that they also highlight that a major number of 50 caliber rifles have been recovered in, in Mexico. But in the, in the U.S. side, there's also evidence that assault weapons are being trafficked. Right here, I'm laying three examples, just three examples, but there are more, uh, of ATF press releases where they involve uh, efforts to traffic assault weapons into Mexico. Uh, one was in 2017, one in 2015, and one in 2014. Um, again, there's, there's evidence that the, the link between guns produced in the U.S., and violence in Mexico is more than just a statistical coincidence. Uh, and this is just to show what it looks like when members of organized groups, criminal groups, use these weapons. Uh, for example, this was in 2019 in a municipality in Coahuila in the northern state of Mexico. Uh, 22 uh, people were killed and shot. This was an attack on the offices of the municipality, and this is what it looked like afterwards. Um, in addition, of course, to the helicopters being taken down by, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 50 caliber rifles. Uh, in 2019, we all, well, this was a major uh, uh, event, worldwide news. The fact that the son of uh, uh, the famous cartel leader, Chapo Guzman, the son of Chapo Guzman was captured, but was then released because of the, the, the immense power that the, the Sinaloa cartel showed. And this is just a picture of that day where they have uh, 50 caliber rifles, AK-47. So eventually the, the, the president decided to release the son of El Chapo Guzman. Um, again, the, the criminal groups in Mexico are armed to their teeth. Um, and then just to highlight that, that the problem goes beyond Mexico. This, again, these are just a couple examples of U.S. guns that are recovered elsewhere. Uh, in Brazil, for example, the U.S. is the biggest source of illegal foreign guns. Uh, guns bought illegally in the United States are arming Colombian uh, uh, me uh, criminal members. Uh, even Chile, uh, there's a news in Chile in 2018 uh, that they found a, 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 an important trafficking ring that was importing U.S. weapons to their country. And then obviously there's examples in the Northern Triangle, uh, an area that has been devastated by, by violence and gun violence in, in recent years. <clears throat> so uh, just to conclude a couple of, of thoughts and ideas. Uh, first of all, I, I think that when analyzing the US gun industry, we need to consider international markets. Uh, we need to start asking questions about the proportion of the sales with, that stay in this country, that go abroad, I, I think we should, we need to start exploring those types of questions and answers. Um, I, it, it is without a doubt, you know, that Mexico and other Latin American countries have to address internal factors that contribute to violence as, as Manuel has uh, given the example in Venezuela and, and the same in Mexico. There's, there's issues of corruption, there's issues of impunity of weak police forces. Yes, they absolutely have to address those problems. But the United States must recognize its shared responsibility in fueling that violence through gun trafficking. Um, it is also important that when assessing the impact, positive or negative, of U.S. gun policies, we must address its international implications as well. We know, for example, that the assault weapons ban, uh, thanks to the research done by Omar Garcia Ponce, it had a direct uh, effect on, on uh, uh, northern municipalities in, in Mexico. Uh, of course, that banning or highly regulating assault weapons as well as high capacity magazines 
would mitigate international uh, gun trafficking. But we also need to think about other complementary measures, such as uh, uh, you know, universal background checks. We know that gun shows are an important source of uh, traffickers, so they can purchase guns and then cross them into Mexico. So uh, uh, universal background checks is also key. And then the last point is make data available. Uh, again, I mentioned the TR amendment that was implemented in the mid 2000s. Uh, ATF is not able to release data that we know it has, and that would be of great help to researchers and analysts to detect how guns are moved from the United States into Mexico, but that data is not made available. So we need to uh, also make efforts to have that data uh, available. And with that, I will end. Thank you. Eugenio, thank you so much um, for you know, sharing that uh, perspective on how the uh, lack of an assault weapons ban in America impacts um, the countries you know, south of our border. But it's important to note that it impacts um, country north of our border as well. Um, some of the guns um, that were used by the mass shooter in Canada uh, were smuggled in America. Um, so it's really critical that we pass a ban um, even after Canada, you know, the 1,500 types of assault weapons um, that they plan to do. So thank you for that. And um, I think we're ready now with Tiffany. Do you have the uh, video from Philip ready to go? Yeah, let's try again. Thank you. Can you see it? Good afternoon. I've been asked to bring a global perspective to the debate over banning assault weapons in the Americas. So I'll start with some raw facts. According to the Geneva-based Small Arms Survey, there are more than a billion firearms in the world. 86% of these are in the hands of civilians. Annual production is about 8 million new firearms, plus 10 to 15 billion rounds of ammunition. That's enough bullets to shoot every person in the world, not once, but twice every year. Most firearms and ammunition are in the United States. America has less than 5% of the world's population, yet its citizens hold about 50% of the world's guns. For sheer numbers, no other nation comes close. Likewise, the rate of civilian firearm ownership per 100,000 population is highest in the United States. The next closest country is Yemen, followed by Switzerland, whose standing army includes most of its adult population. Way down to the right are the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, and Japan. And the most serious effect of all these firearms, a study of global gun deaths published in JAMA estimates that 250,000 people died by gunshot in 2016. And that figure is likely to be conservative. In the total number of gun deaths, that is, all firearm-related mortality regardless of motivation, the United States Brazil has one third fewer people, but reports many more deaths by gunshot. Perhaps more meaningful is the rate of all gun deaths per 100,000 population. Here, Brazil surpasses the US by a higher margin, while South Africa also creeps up. But now countries, the total number of gun deaths, lower income countries, we just don't have the data. So to compare all countries, the most reliable global indicator is gun homicide. By the numbers, Brazil is ahead by an even wider margin. To the right, many of the world's wealthier countries remain low in comparison. But then, when we chart all the countries with the highest rates of gun homicide around the world, we see this. Where's the United States? Way down to the right, the bright red bar third from the left, the end. America is now the only wealthy country on this chart. As you can see, globally, the countries most affected by gun violence are in Latin America, the Caribbean, and Southern Africa, plus the Philippines. Enough charts for now. We all know how and why America chose to tread its unique path with regard to firearms. But this wasn't the only cause of the country's global exceptionalism in gun control. More than a century ago, the dominant European and Asian empires moved in exactly the opposite direction. Their cities were beset with street violence, and some of the criminals, anarchists, and Bolsheviks had guns. 
In London, three policemen and a Latvian revolutionary died in the Sydney Street siege of 1911. That's Home Secretary Winston Churchill wearing a top hat, having his picture taken at the scene of the shooting. British police, routinely unarmed even to this day, had to summon the Scots guards to bring some guns to the gunfight. And highlighted in the middle of the photo, there's Churchill again. And so it was that more than a century ago, the empires of Europe and Asia invoked public shootings as a, as a reason for all to agree on three central pillars. The person, license all gun owners. The object, register all firearms. The right, defined in legislation as a conditional privilege. It's that third pillar which explains why, among all this, only the United States has a Second Amendment. Because the global empires were just that, Asian gun control laws were copied to about 150 colonies around the globe. Although it's these colonial era pillars of law which enable most governments to keep a handle on the misuse of firearms, an even more potent force has recently changed the face of gun control. There was a day when injury by gunshot was seen almost exclusively as a crime problem. Most of the proposed solutions fell into the bottom of the cliff variety, after the fact law enforcement and retribution. But to public health practitioners, the gun is to gun violence as the mosquito is to malaria. Bullets and firearms are the agents of harm and both are amenable to standard injury prevention procedures. Instead of waiting until after the damage was done, advanced societies developed a range of well-proven harm prevention measures, just as they had for the epidemics of automobile injury, tobacco-related disease, HIV AIDS, smallpox, and many others. So here's the thing. Americans have already invented, tested, and proved most of the solutions the world needs to overcome this epidemic. On our roads, we all deployed a holistic array of evidence-based public health measures to dramatically reverse the toll of death and injury by automobile. America led the way, the world followed suit, and we will always be grateful for that example. All of this took safer cars, safer roads, drink driving laws, traffic calming, but also the three pillars of automobile control. The person, license all drivers. The object, register all vehicles, and the right, defined in legislation as a conditional privilege. Remember that motor vehicle licensing and registration did not lead to mass confiscation. Sure, abuse the privilege of motorized mobility and you lose your license, but you'll notice that automobiles remain unchanged as symbols of masculinity, power, and freedom. Public safety campaigns from tobacco harm reduction to HIV AIDS, smallpox, malaria, Ebola, saved countless millions of lives. The same as being done today with COVID-19. In each case, America's public health and legal communities eventually overcame the denial of cashed up interest groups and the world followed your example. With HIV AIDS, you even set aside religious objections, which in those days were just as potent as the God-given right to bear arms. But realistically, licensing gun owners and registering their weapons, that's just a bridge too far, right? Well, not for Franklin Roosevelt. The St. Valentine's Day massacre prompted your National Firearms Act of 1934 to license all owners of machine guns, silencers, sawn off shotguns and rifles, and to register their weapons. 86 years later, the NFA remains US federal law, and machine guns and sawn off long guns are still the weapons least used in armed violence. From Hawaii to Connecticut and Massachusetts, Americans have already shown that licensing and registration can help to curb gun violence. But again, realistically, it's just too big a job, right? Please, the entire Euro European community registers every cow. India has a population of 1.4 billion, and yet 80% of households in India register the LPG bottles they rely on for cooking. We do know how to do these things. 
Now, I don't suggest for a moment that you can just repeat what other countries have done. In Australia, Conservative Prime Minister John Howard became the first leader known to have worn a bulletproof vest. He faced up to the rump of his supporters, that's rural gun owners, and told them to surrender most of their semi-automatic long guns. Australia has now destroyed well over a million guns. That's about one third of the country's civilian firearms. And the cost? A one-year Medicare levy of 0.2% collected about $15 from each taxpayer. To add perspective, a similar effort in the United States would require the destruction of 90 million firearms. Australia's first priority was to reduce the risk of mass shootings. The second broader target was to reduce the much more common overall risk of gun death and injury. And the results? 22 years without a public mass shooting. Now, sadly for Australia, that drought was broken when in 2018, a licensed gun owner, a farmer in Western Australia, killed his family of five and then himself. That number of victims just meets the threshold for a mass shooting. So since the post Port Arthur gun laws, overall the risk of dying by gunshot in Australia has more than halved. And there's been no substitution of method. Murderers did not switch to other weapons. Australia's rate of gun homicide per 100,000 people is now 25 times also, in the wake of mass shootings, the United Kingdom first and destroyed not just privately owned assault rifles, but almost every private handgun. Brazil and Argentina followed with their own large-scale gun buybacks and bans. Last year, New Zealand banned military-style semi-automatic long guns, bought them back at fair market price, and plans to progressively destroy them all. Canada will soon do the same with so-called assault weapons. Now, this is confiscation of private property under threat of a prison term. And I know that's not the American way. But now even the retired justices of the US Supreme Court have mentioned the heretical truth. The Second Amendment is just an amendment. Americans are free to introduce or to repeal a constitutional amendment, just as you did to expand suffrage to all citizens, to end slavery, and to introduce and to repeal prohibition. Given the frequency and scale of firearm-related human rights violations in America with no turning point in sight, such a step should surely not be considered unmentionable. I'll be stunned if this happens in my lifetime, but I am confident that our children or grandchildren will see the day. Thank you and good luck. Well, that was an incredible presentation um, from Philip Alpers um, from Australia. Uh, they have tackled the issue of gun violence in their country, and I'm certain that we can do the same. Um, the next uh, panelist is my friend, and I think she's a superhero. Um, it's, she's Dr. Kyle Ann Hunter. Um, until a couple of weeks ago, she was the Vice President of Programs at Brady, um, but she is now a Brady Fellow and she is the professor um, at the Air Force Academy. Um, she's also a Marine Corps combat veteran with multiple combat deployments as an, an AH-1W Super Cobra attack pilot. So she has um, you know, a very clear understanding of assault weapons. So Kai, welcome. I'm gonna... Thank you. The uh, National Shooting Sports Foundation, the NSSF, um, which is a gun lobby that is headquartered right here in Newtown, about three miles from the Sandy Hook Elementary School. They've recently tweeted that if someone calls an AR-15 style rifle an assault weapon, then they've been duped by an agenda. The NSSF is the group that rebranded assault weapons as modern sporting rifles to sell more weapons of war for the gun industry. So as a veteran trained to use weapons of war, could you explain why NSSF is wrong? Yeah, absolutely. And first, thank you so much for having me. This is such a, a great group to 
to be a part of. Um, I don't have slides or presentation, so you all just get to hear me talk for, for a while and be very uh, professorial, um, as it were, but really speak for more of a, a, a personal experience. Um, so as Poe mentioned, I'm a, I'm a Marine, and you probably have all heard the saying, every Marine a rifleman. It's something we take very, very seriously. And it is no mistake that the M16A2 service rifle is the iconic rifle of the, the Marine Corps as well. So to get to Poe's question though, I want you to, to all just sort of imagine for a moment, we're gonna go back in time here, that you are a Marine or a Army uh, infantry soldier in Vietnam and you are still using the same equipment that was designed for World War I and then a little later World War II, which was essentially stable trench warfare, where you set up positions that stayed in place. And so the weapons that you were given, the personal weapons you were given were, were heavy. The M1 Garand, which was the, the gun at the time, weighed um, a little over nine pounds without any ammunition to it. Um, fully fully loaded so like with a magazine it was going to be upwards of 15 pounds and then plus you had to carry any ammunition with you um, and I don't know if anyone has even just like held a baby for a long time that's around nine pounds like they get really heavy really fast and now imagine that you have to now walk for very very long periods of, of time through jungle wearing a lot of gear it's hot it's uncomfortable and the dod really quickly realized at this time that this rifle was actually becoming a liability for american service members and the Viet Cong, who at the time were using the soviet made uh, ak-47 which was light maneuverable had higher rates of fire um, lower ammunition rate were essentially outgunning U.S. forces. And so they went out and said, okay, let's, we need to make something better. And um, I have a TED Talk, uh, American Problem, Weapons of War, Places of Peace, where I go well into the history. But the short punchline was Armalite, which is um, what the, the AR, like the AR part actually comes from, created what became the, the M16, that is the AR-15 platform. And it was a gun that was about three and a half pounds lighter. And so again, if you imagine if you take three and a half pounds out of something you have to carry around. Um, the ammunition was about a third of the weight. Um, and you know, as Stephen had mentioned earlier, the muzzle velocity was much faster. The bullets are lightweight plus this high muzzle velocity, which creates greater lethality. So you have a lighter weapon, it's also about uh, six inches shorter, so it's more maneuverable, easier to, to move around the, the jungle with it at the time. And now it's this exact same uh, gun that we were moving around. You see Marines and, and soldiers moving house to house in Iraq and Afghanistan because it's light. Uh, ammunition, you can carry three times as much for the weight. And something that's been sort of danced around a little bit, but is really essential to when we're talking about the lethality is you have a high capacity, so we can accept rounds of, you know, if you look at uh, Dayton, up to 100 of rounds that are very, very quick to extract and reload. You know, it's not a fix. You can reload incredibly, incredibly quickly. You know, with training, it takes a matter of, of seconds to reload these things. So when we think about why we call this a weapon of war, well, what you want in war, lightweight, easily maneuverable, easy to change magazines, and you can carry a lot of ammo. And so if you want to kill a lot of people as quickly as possible, this is a great choice. It, uh, these same characteristics, though, also make this a horrible, horrible gun for hunting or home defense. And this is where the NSSF did a lot of this work in, uh, in rebranding it. But if you get down to the brass tacks of this gun, it is bad. So if we think about home defense, people will say, oh, it's good because it's light and it, anyone can use it. You know, again, the, the pictures that Stephen were showing, like kids can carry these around pretty easily, which is a whole nother issue that we, isn't really the topic of, of today. But you, these rounds were designed to be able to penetrate a soldier's helmet at over 300 yards. 
So that same velocity can <laughs> the wall. I think, you know, many of us live in houses where there's other people in them. So if you're there thinking, oh, I'm going to get this intruder. Well, going through another wall in your own house. Um, most of us don't live that far away from our neighbors. You're thinking about going through a, a, a neighbor's wall. And to think that accuracy, if you are well-trained in the heat of a moment battle, there's still only around a 30% accuracy rate. So the average person who's not out there training every single day you got to think really highly of yourself if you're going to be that accurate, but you're not, which is, again, a whole other issue to talk about. You know, what are you going to hit on the other side of that, that round? And again, if you think back to the, so, so home defense, not good. You think back to those pictures that Stephen showed of how torn up or the, or of uh, Manny's impossible operation there, just how much destruction's there. If you want to go hunting, that is not what you want happening to your meat that you go eat and hunt. It's gonna become useless. And so this is a gun, the platform, the AR-15 platform, which is virtually unchanged. Really the only difference between what's available in the civilian world and what is part of the military is that the selector switch cannot go fully automatic or burst in the civilian version. It can just go semi-automatic. But as we see in places like Dayton, where it took 33 seconds to kill nine and injure 15 people. I mean, that's 33 seconds. That's really no time at, at all. That lack of automatic feature isn't stopping anything. And then you, on the other side of it, Marine, one of the first things you learn when you get your M16 as a Marine is not to put it on fully automatic because that's actually not the most effective way to shoot it. It's much more effective to shoot it in the semi-automatic round. And so when we say these are weapons of war. It is because these features that are key to the AR-15 platform are features that were explicitly asked for by the Department of Defense to make it easier for our soldiers to be most, most lethal, which is something that we might want in war, but we have no need for in, in places of, of peace. And I think, you know, as a, as a, as a veteran and as someone who spent uh, more time in my 20s and 30s in Iraq and Afghanistan than I actually did in the United States, um, a antidote about why this is such a unique American problem really stands out to me and what really drove me into advocacy along this piece. So uh, when I was finishing my dissertation, um, I was a, a researcher in residence out at University of San Diego. And they had this program called the Women's Peacemakers Program. And uh, they brought women from around the world who were working in complex zones. And, and one of the women was uh, from Afghanistan, um, Waz Mafro, who's an amazing, amazing woman, like one of the, the only women to actually sit down and have Taliban negotiations. I mean, she's incredible. Um, so we were out there and she brought her small daughter with her, her uh, three-year-old daughter, because she was afraid to leave her daughter back in Afghanistan. Um, the Vegas massacre happened that, that fall. Um, that October. And the first thing she came and said to me was, I want to go back to Afghanistan. I don't feel safe being in the States anymore. And because the feeling was in Afghanistan, she knew who the bad guys with guns were. It was very obvious that individuals who walked around with AK-47s are more common there, but with these weapons of war were very clearly bad guys. And we have created a culture here where people say, you know, oh, I'm a good guy with a gun. I'm a good guy with a gun. Well, if you look at the style of most mass shooters, and who, again, the, these weapons of war, the weapons of choice of these mass shooters, they're quote unquote good guys until they aren't. And it is so easy for anyone to walk into a, a store and buy one of these things and say, I'm just a good guy with a gun. We've created this culture that having more guns somehow is ridiculous, um, that people feel safer in actual war zones than they do here because of the uncertainty that this has, has created. Well, thank you so much for um, your perspective and clearing that up for the uh, National Shooting Sports Foundation. Um, I want yeah, to talk with them too, but they won't return my calls. So I know. <laughs> exactly. 
Um, so yeah, I watched your TED Talk. So anyone interested in learning more should definitely watch Kai's TED Talks. It's, it's incredible and, and very valuable. Um, Kai, um, Brady has been one of our strongest allies in the campaign against assault weapons um, to pass HR 1296 and S66. Um, and I wanted to see if you could describe the legislative proposal in greater detail. Yeah, so, so these, these bills are, um, are really from a, both a supply and a, and a demand side, which is important, and we know these, these bans work. I think something that's important to, to look at with regards to what we call assault weapons is that they actually represent a minority of guns owned by American civilians. These aren't, it, this isn't like we're going to walk around to everyone's house and take their hunting rifle away. Like that's just not, not what is going to happen. These are a very small minority, but as has been mentioned by just about every other panelist, they have a outsized impact, not only on the, the death rate, the, the homicide rate, the mass shooting rate, but also on the fear of the American psyche that exists. You know, we have a, a time where researchers are, are showing right now that uh, kids are actually, their learning outcomes are because they are afraid to be in school. And they tie that fear directly to the fear of these assault weapons. And so that, that's, so when we look about this, I think it's an important aspect to put out. We're not going to be going and rounding up 400 million guns. Um, that's, that's happening right now. These are a minority. It's also really important to, to note that um, these, are, uh, these are policies that are very, very popular. You know, just a year ago, August of 2019 was the latest poll done on this, and over 70% of Americans support a, a ban on assault weapons. I mean, so, so this is something that the American people are demanding, and I think that's, that's absolutely essential because our legislators are supposed to work for, for us um, that, that are there. So what these would, would actually do is make it a crime to knowingly import, sale, manufacture, transfer, or possess a semiotic assault weapon or large capacity ammunition defeating device is what they actually call it. It's essentially a high capacity magazine. And they're, they're very well defined in there. There are grandfather clauses for guns that were bought either after the last ban expired or previous to the ban that is there. So it would start now, um, which is important. There are, um, there are voluntary buyback provisions to this for people to, to get rid of guns. Um, but why it's important is that it's actually feasible because we've seen this work before. You know, we have seen this is very much modeled off of a successful assault weapon ban that we have, have had. And, you know, it, it creates a, a system where supply is going to be going down. You, know, you can't make any new versions of these for, for civilians. And so it's either going to drive the price way up and put it out of people's you know, ability to buy it, which is just simple. You know, this is where everybody should love it. It's supply and demand economics. Isn't that how we're supposed to solve all of our problems? You know, <laughs> um, a little bit of sarcasm there if you can't, uh, can, can't tell. But, but so it should be incredibly, incredibly popular for that reason. Um, and it's, it's also, you know, it has grant systems for this buyback program uh, list as, as a part of it too, so that it's not going to put the burden on communities to actually in, engage in the, in the buybacks for it, which is incredibly important. Um, and it's, it's really important um, as well because it is going to limit this, what we've seen time and time again with the mass shootings of somebody who has some sort of grudge against the world out there or is upset about um, a, a romantic interest that went wrong in school, which is unfortunately what we see in a lot of, of school shootings, or just has some desire to die by police suicide, which is something else we see in, in so many of these mass shootings, from walking into a store and buying the most deadly means of killing somebody almost instantaneously and, and unchecked. It's going to slow that process. We know that slowing that process, quelling the supply, actually saves lives. You know, once the ban expired, there was a 183% increase in deaths from mass shootings from during, during the ban. So quelling the supply, stopping the, the manufacturer, allowing for the grandfathering in, just because it, it'll help make it more politically feasible, is something that, that 
will work. And why it's, it's also important, and a, a big part of this is that it's also going to make it illegal to export these to other countries. You can't make them here and then go sell them in Mexico. Um, either to civilians, which is going to send us a good neighbor, is something we need to think about as well. Thank you so much for um, explaining that in greater detail, because I don't think people really understand what's in there, in that bill. Yeah, um, and I think one that comes up with it too is that this is particularly focused on the, the right, it's not a handgun ban, um, that's, that's there. there. There are some weapons that look more like handguns that would be included based on the, um, you know, their, their accessories and, and some of their, their other features, but also in this, in this band. And most, most handguns that are, are sold are what are considered semi-automatic. Mm -hmm. Semi-automatic essentially just meaning that every, a bullet's going to come out. You don't have to actually manually cock it or there isn't a mechanical mechanism that's moving Well, thank you. And um, I think it's important to note that um, the legislation uh, calls for banning 205 different types of assault weapons. Um, yep. And um, we also support uh, an effort to register the existing grandfathered weapons under the Firearms Act. Yep. Um, in Connecticut, we have an assault weapons ban. We have them register, you know, their grandfather weapons. So I think that's important. Yep. Uh, measure that we need and, to come up with. And that's what we've seen too, like in the states that have the registration for the grandfathered weapons, we've actually seen a reduction in um, adverse outcomes, so in, in homicides, in, in mass shootings. Um, and they've also, I think it's important to look at, they've all been upheld as being constitutional. So this can work, it doesn't violate your right. Say as uh, someone who has been involved in shooting sports for over 30 years, a gun owner essentially my entire life here stir my 22 pound corgi because she might be don't have to what register any of there's a little bit of delay kai uh, that's absolutely crazy oh, oh sorry there's a little bit of delay um, <laughs> but thank you so much and I wish you the best of luck um, at the Air Force Academy. They're in good hands and I uh, hope to see you again in DC sometime soon. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we are going to move on. Um, we're running a little late, um, but our final panelist is another superhero of mine. Um, her name is Eve Levinson. Uh, she is the Policy and Government Affairs Manager for March for Our Lives and she's a student at Georgetown, uh, George Washington University, and I've spent many, many hours lobbying with her. Um, she is by far one of the best young organizers I know, and I appreciate her tireless efforts um, on coalition building, and I can't wait for the pandemic to stop so we can get back down there and lobby Congress again. So, so Eve, um, since inception, March for Our Lives embraced a ban on assault weapons. And since then, the support for assault weapons ban has grown. Like Kai said, as much as 70% of Americans um, supporting it. I know it's a priority for the young people across America. Could you share the work that March for Our Lives um, has been doing um, to help pass the HR 1296 and S66 bills? Definitely. Well, first of all, Poe, thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, and thank you so much for having me on. Um, as you know, I'm so thankful to have gotten the opportunity to work with you and other folks here. And I think that it's also worth pointing out that I think that young people are so often left out of these sorts of conversations where it's about the policy itself. And I'm so thankful that there are folks like you who were willing to sort of like open up the space and mentor the young people like us who are coming in and see us both as equals, but give us that history. Um, and I would hope that folks around this call who are in similar situations when you create spaces like this, make sure not only include young people when you're asking to get something going viral on social media, or you want them to sort of call their um, 
um, to like call their representatives but actually engage them in the actual policy and the advocacy and the part to go forward with. Because I think that, and leading to your question, I think that that really speaks to what we've been able to do on the assault weapons ban. So as we know, the assault weapons ban wasn't necessarily something that was so generally a priority for the gun violence prevention movement, despite the fact that um, the gun violence prevention movement really uh, is most popular after instances of mass shootings when assault weapons are used. Um, and so that was something that I myself am not personally um, a part of one of the co-founders of March for Lives, but I got involved um, in Los Angeles when it started and have over the last year been on the March for Lives staff. Um, and that was something that was really, sorry, I will speak more slowly. Um, <laughs> that was something that was really important to all the founders of March for Our Lives to unapologetically call for what we want, even if it's not necessarily gonna be something we can get in the next few days. And I think that that's what's really important in the through line across all of the work you see youth doing is that you need to imagine what you want the ideal to be and you need to push for that while you're pushing for more incremental reforms. Um, and so in terms of the work that we've done around the assault weapons ban, I think that really the work that everybody spoke to is sort of what we try to do. We try to take the approach of doing the policy advocacy. So going on the Hill, working very closely with Poe and the policy folks at Brady, um, driving constituent outreach from all of our supporters, educating young people on it, and then also doing the sort of advocacy that Manny is so incredible at doing about also looking at how do we change the culture? How do we reach people who don't necessarily identify as wanting to talk about policy, but who still care about this? And how do we engage them in getting um, change as well? Well, thank you. Thank you for your work, because I think you really helped to change the dialogue, um, you know, after the <laughs> shooting. It's regrettable that that's what it takes, but um, we're so happy that you're in this space because like Manny said, you know, you guys are our future and we're here to kind of help you propel, you know, your agenda and efforts so that we can do, you know, get that ban passed. Um, so what do you think is the most important thing that Americans can do right now, young and old, to pass the ban? So I think, honestly, the most important thing is looking towards the election. So we know that um, the vast majority of Americans support an assault weapons ban, but it's not getting passed. We know that even more people support universal background checks, but it's not getting passed. And so I think the most important thing to do is to replace the people in office who aren't willing to get it passed, but that also means we need to acknowledge why is that the case. And a lot of it comes from the sort of systemic voter suppression that we see happening, and particularly the way in which our systems are set up to make sure that those who are most affected by gun violence, particularly black and brown communities, don't have access to the ballot. And that's one of the reasons why I think we see um, the people who represent us in Congress make the laws not representing the will of the people. Um, and so there is actually a campaign that Brady and March for Our Lives just launched to focus on how do we actually change these voting laws. Um, and so I can put a link to that in the chat, but I would really encourage people to check that out because I think that it's really important that we vote and we spread awareness, but we also need to know that they, the systems are set up so that that doesn't work. So we need to both change the systems while also working within those systems. And in that case, that means we need to call our legislators, we need to vote, but we also need to make it easier for people who aren't allowed the right to vote to be able to access the right to vote. I think you're right, Eve. I think it's really important. And that's been a priority for our organization as well. Um, we've been volunteering for all these years, but we decided to hire a part-time person to focus on turnout 2020 um, to get, uh, you know, to seek out some volunteers to help us call low propensity voters in swing states. So that's been a huge priority for us and also making endorsements of the gun safety candidates so that um, voters know who should um, be supported um, on the ballots on November 3rd. So thank you so much for joining us and I look forward to continuing to work with you down in Washington, D.C. Um, and in the interest of time, I know that there are some questions. Um, what we'll do is uh, we'll collect the questions and try to um, get those questions answered for our audience um, through email. Um, so we have a few minutes, so I wanted to just um, share some thoughts on what actions um, you know, our audience can take to support the campaign against uh, assault weapons. Um, like Eve said, I think the, one of the most important things a person can do is um, vote for gun safety candidates in 2020. 2020 and um, we want to make sure that everyone is registered to vote. Bring your friends. You know, make um, a campaign against assault weapons an issue. You know, to talk to your uh, representatives and senators and others and you know, tell them that you value banning weapons of war and other legislative proposals that are necessary. Um, 
organizations that have not joined on to the campaign um, can join. Um, you can reach out to me at pmurray at newtownaction.org. And also we bring families that are directly impacted by gun violence down to DC with us to lobby Congress. And that's been one of the most effective ways to change hearts and minds. So we encourage you to donate to us and donate to the other organizations um, so that we can get our job done. But I wanna thank all our panelists for joining us today. Um, you've brought you know, various perspective and your expertise to this issue. And I hope to continue to work with you um, to get this ban passed. And I know that, like I said before, if we can maintain the House, flip the Senate and the White House, I think that there's a real chance that we can pass a ban in the very near future. So please continue to you know, pursue um, this campaign with us and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Poe. Thank you. Thank you, Poe. Bye. Thanks, Poe. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Oh, just quickly, I forgot. I just want, um, there is a mass shooting in America virtual briefing at 3 p.m. today. Um, GVpedia is presenting their, um, their uh, research on that topic. So please join them. And also don't forget to join the uh, other webinar series. Um, uh, there's one next week on Thursday um, at two, 1, 1 p.m. again. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day.